Hey guys, uh, it's great to be back in Cape Town. So I'm here today to talk about uh, Bitcoin and uh, the future of, of, of this uh, interesting piece of technology. So I'm sure everyone's heard varying things and have different levels of knowledge um, on Bitcoin. And so I've got to clarify a few things up front. First of all, I don't work for Bitcoin. Nobody works for Bitcoin. It's a piece of software. It's not a company. And uh, a lot of people think that the shares are traded. They're not. They're actually the units of Bitcoin that are traded on various exchanges. Um, it's also it's a very interesting uh, technology because as much as you think it's not traceable and anonymous as a currency, it's actually way more traceable than cash. And, and so people are talking about Bitcoin being the future of money. So I want to talk a little bit about the history of money and work us into you know, a discussion of where Bitcoin could go. So if you look at one of the biggest social problems out there is, is it's trust, right? Trust doesn't scale, uh, scale very well. And that's because you can trust the people around you, your family, your friends. Uh, but as it gets you know, wider and wider into society, you need things like institutions, law, contracts, um, just in you know, order to make sure that you feel comfortable doing transactions. So when we have this problem that we're trying to solve with scaling, uh, and you look at how we've done it as a society in the past, um, We've used things like gold um, to scale, and, and gold is basically backed by money and banks. And well, my, eventually the gold went away, and then the banks had crises, which 2008, 2009 financial crisis, you saw banks basically need to be bailed out because they didn't have anything to back the notes that they issued. Uh, you've also had governments being hacked and personal data being uh, thrown all over the place in recent months. So we have a trust problem in society. And so one of the hopes around Bitcoin is that can, can, by using math and algorithms, can we solve some of these problems? So what, what is money exactly? And, and so I like to think of money as commoditized trust. You know, if you think back 500 years, 1,000 years, we, we didn't trust each other, obviously. So when we had the barter system where you would swap you know, bread for milk, for leather, for any other goods, it was really hard to keep track of who owed what to who, especially when you were producing excess amounts of one, one commodity or another, or one piece of good versus another. And so gold became a store of value. Uh, gold is interesting because it's a fixed commodity. There's only a certain amount of gold in the world that's been created over the millions of years the Earth's been around. So, and there's a certain supply that comes in, a certain amount of gold that gets mined every single year. It, it's very stable in that sense, and over, over hundreds of years, it's been trusted as a store of value, and people have used it uh, in that sense. So we had this, this situation where we started to trust people in society, we, we decided to start trusting something versus people. Um, and you know, over time, that, that changed, because gold is not scalable. You, know, you don't walk around with bars of gold when you want to go buy a house, or uh, you know, it's just, it gets kind of heavy, right? So, so what do we do? <laughs> we locked it up in bank vaults. We gave it to the banks, we gave it to governments, and we said, you guys store the gold, give us a piece of paper which kind of tells us that the gold is there, we hope, but it's a bit of a black box, right? Because you don't know if the gold is there or not. And in fact, uh, most or many in most countries have moved away from the gold standard. So well, the, the notes that you're holding today don't represent gold anymore. It, they just don't. And this is where we have the financial crisis of 2008 is over leveraged banks and financial institutions. So we were taught to trust someone or an institution. And so in 2008, uh, a group of programmers, or one, we're not sure, came up with the concept of Bitcoin. And they wrote the software and they open sourced it, which basically means that the code is there for anyone in the world to have a look at and inspect. And so the best computer scientists, the best mathematicians, they've all been looking at this code for years. And Bitcoin's had some ups and downs in the past, but it's gotten to a point now where in the past two or three years, it's, it, you know, to use the word unhackable is probably a bad explanation of what it is because it's actually not something which can be hacked. Um, and it, the mathematical algorithms that go into Bitcoin are actually very secure, especially when you have millions of computers now putting computing power into it. So we've gotten to a point where we've moved from a physical commodity to something which is a digital commodity, and I'll explain more about that in a second. But, you know, just bear with me. We're going to see if we can use math to solve the trust issues in society. So what exactly is a Bitcoin? Well, it's, it's a unit of measure. So in your mind, picture this. Imagine you had a spreadsheet with 21 million cells in that spreadsheet. Okay? And each cell 
could only be owned by one person at one point in time. Okay, or, and, and you can obviously own multiple cells. Now, that's a, a novel concept. Now, imagine if that spreadsheet was live on the internet and everyone can see what is in those cells. And each cell could hold 100 million pieces of information. Now, that's basically what the Bitcoin network is. It's this huge piece of information uh, which sits on what we call a public ledger. And so when you make a transaction, it's public. What happens to that cell, who it gets transferred to, how it moves around, that's public. And you cannot, you cannot fake a transfer because it's all time-stamped and it's, it's, it's processed by millions of computers. Um, so, so take that aside for a second. If all the cells are exactly the same, then it's a commodity because they're, you know, they're homogenous, right? Every single cell is the same. They can hold 100 million pieces of information. Now, what's that worth? Something. What can we use it for? Many things. And I think we're still in the very early stages of what we can do with this. And I'll talk about some of the examples in a second. But fundamentally, the one problem it solves better than any other software solution over the past couple of years is the double spend problem, which is if I give a Bitcoin to somebody and that Bitcoin is worth $250 and that person receives it, I cannot transfer that cell to anyone else because the position has changed and a million computers have confirmed it. In order to fake that, you'd need another million computers, which is not very, it's not feasible uh, you know, in, in the current world that we're in with Bitcoin. So it solves elegantly what they call the double spend problem. And if you think about the music industry today, you copy a music file, you can give it 100 people. There's no tracking of it. There's no way anyone can stop that. In the Bitcoin network, it can be stopped. And you prevent people from double spending. So that's novel. So now you've got 21 million of these commoditized units of currency, because like gold, it could be an ounce of, it could be a bar of gold, it could be a cell. What is that worth? And how can we turn that into a currency, or how can we use it for other, for other things? So Bitcoin has gone through a lot of speculation in the past couple of years. It started off being something which was relatively cheap, pennies. It was very flat. You know, this is the price chart of Bitcoin so far. It was flat for a while, a couple of spikes here and there. But about you know, 2013, all of a sudden, the world started waking up to what Bitcoin is about, what it can be used for, primarily as a currency. So uh, we saw the crisis in Malta, banks shutting down, banks taking money out of people's accounts, and people started buying into, uh, into Bitcoin as an alternative currency. And interestingly enough, you can transfer Bitcoins over the internet. You can't exactly you know, transfer gold over the internet. So because it's limited, it has value. And speculators are basically going in and figuring out the price. So what they did was they ran the price up to about 1000 bucks per Bitcoin uh, in 2000 and, I think it was 2013 and 2013. And it's come down since. So the price has had a field day. You know, one minute it's up you know, 50 times in a year. The other minute it's down 75%. And so it's, Bitcoin is, in the, in the eyes of the media, died about 72 times, according to BitcoinObituaries.com, who tracks what the press is saying about Bitcoin. But what's interesting to me is when you see the growth in interest in Bitcoin from developers, it's, there's more interest in Bitcoin than in a product like PayPal. Uh, and the growth is astounding. There are more people trying to figure out how to use Bitcoin than pretty much any other payment technology out there. And I'm, when I say trying to figure out, no one knows. Okay, we don't know what we're going to use this thing for. We know it's very cool and interesting to have a public ledger. And, and I'll show you an example of what our industry is doing uh, with a public ledger. But it, it, it's, it's really something where the use case of Bitcoin is yet to be solved. It's sort of like the Internet 94. We didn't know exactly how we'd be using it, but we knew there was something there. Which brings me to my next point. Um, if you look at the first dot-coms, okay, and how there was this huge interest and then it kind of subsided and everyone believed, well, you know, it's all over. Um, that's, that's the stock price of, of a very famous dot-com company where went through the roof, kind of collapsed. Everyone believed, well, this thing's not going to take off anywhere. People were calling for you know, the CEO to shut the company down, the CEO to get fired, et cetera, et cetera, stop raising money. And you know, if you look at where Amazon.com is today, I think we can agree that the highs of the dot-com have been surpassed, I think, five or six times at least. So you just need to have a long-term view on technology because these things don't play out over a couple of months. It plays out over years especially with the collective efforts of thousands of the world's smartest people is going into a part of a technology like Bitcoin, they're going to solve the problems and they're going to find use cases around Bitcoin. And so 
I just want to draw the analogy to where the Bitcoin price is today. It's actually very similar. And this is not because this is a, this is a psychological issue. Okay, this is speculation, which is what happened in two, you know, pre-2000, and the psychology of technology. People don't feel, you know, if it doesn't solve a problem right now, it's not valuable right now. That's kind of how, uh, how the world thinks about things sometimes. So in, in the gift card industry, which I, I'm, I'm in, we're looking at how do we use the blockchain to store information. So that cell with 100 million units of information, how can we use it? And so one of the challenges in our industry right now is that as gift card codes move from one person to another, they get compromised. So how do you store it securely, and every time it moves to a different person, the code would change, and therefore the codes aren't compromised? And so we, if we store that with Bitcoin, we could effectively move those codes around, and we could help uh, alleviate fraud uh, and, and theft. And so that's just one example, but there are many others. Uh, there's identity, you know, the guys at Identity 2020 are working with Lucy Liu to help solve the problem of kids who are, uh, you know, left stranded at the border, you know, from child trafficking. How do you give them identity? How do you store that securely online somewhere? How do you make sure that that, that identity travels with that child wherever they go? How, does, how do they rescue kids? Um, financial assets, how do you store financial assets in, in the blockchain? The blockchain is basically the chain and it has the list of all the transactions in the history of Bitcoin. So the blockchain today, as every transaction ever made on Bitcoin is in the blockchain today. You can go back six years and millions of transactions. And so there's governance issues, there's, there's notary. Think about it this way, because every single transaction is timestamped, you can actually use it to notarize digital information as well. And these products and solutions are being built out today. So, you know, there's a lot that's happening in Bitcoin, a lot more than I can cover now. But if you are interested at all, I suggest you, you know, buy some Bitcoins, buy, you know, 200 rands worth, $20, whatever it is, and just try and spend it online. Try and get an experience of it because I think, I believe today we're at the, at the starting point, at the infancy of where this technology is going. And if you want to feel, if you feel this is a big enough idea and that's what we're here for today, you should expose yourself to it. Thank you.